Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Crossroads. And how many mega ball players do we have in the room this morning? Seriously, raise your hand if you bought a mega ball ticket over the weekend. We don't know if there are any winners yet from last night's drawing, but we, it looks like there's a lot of people. A lot of people came up to me this week and said a couple of things about the, the mega ball. They said, number one, uh, that they never play the lottery um, on, on a regular basis, but I'm playing this week because did you hear it's seven hundred million dollars? And I just thought because ten million wouldn't be of use to anyone in the room, right? Uh, but for some reason, all of that money is just too enticing. So people who have never played before um, started playing. We don't know if there's a winner. Um, here's the other thing that I heard from multiple people. Um, after they told me that they never played the lotto and now they have played, they always said this, without fail, if I win, I'm going to give some to the church. Um, as though, I don't know, they thought God might, you know, somehow, that they're the only people that would have ever said that, you know, uh, that somehow God was going to use that and if he does, we will gladly accept it. Um, so, uh, we're going to, I just want to thank God uh, for setting up the introduction to my message because uh, we are going to talk about money uh, this morning for the next couple of weeks. And, and don't you know, like just uh, be honest, it, everyone here would like a little more money, almost everybody I would guess. If I asked you to raise your hands, almost everybody would raise their hand. Very few would say, you know what I really need? is less money that's just sign me up for that program some of you thought think somebody else has signed you up for that program and you wonder how to get off of it right but almost everyone was a yeah it doesn't have to be 700 million dollars in fact you've probably read these statistics because they're all over the place this weekend that people who win the lottery are almost doomed to lose it all in fact the statistic is 70 percent of them will have lost or spent all of their winnings in five years or less. 70% of them. So it doesn't have to be $700 million, but most of us would sign up for a little more uh, money. Very few want a little less. So, so we are going to talk about money um, for this week and for the next several weeks as we begin a series of messages called Money Talks. And the principle, the, the, uh, the, uh, the premise is this, that your money talks about you. It reveals some things about you. What would your money say if it could talk about you? We found a funny video about that, and I want to show it to you now. Take a look. What can I tell you about Benjamin? Our friendship started out great. When I was a kid, I only saw him every now and then. But as I got older, he came around more and more. And that was great too. Until he started to sort of take over. Yo, man, get up, man. It's time to go to work, man. What you doing in the bed? Get up, lazy bones. Go, hey, I don't grow on trees. Come on, man. Time to earn me up some homies, baby. None of us can live without him. But for me, things really got out of control. Toasty O's. Man, you bought generic. We are not toasty old kind of people. What if the neighbors see this in your trash? We are Cheerio folk, Fruity Pebbles, Frankenberry, Pop-Tart folk, man. It's when he took over, nothing was ever good enough. Why didn't we get the movie package? Why didn't we get the movie package? Would it have been too much fun, too majestically awesome to have a universe of entertainment at our fingertips? Fingertips, baby. Almost every piece of mail I got was for him. Hello, little babies. Mm, Pre-approved, just how I like you. Ooh, Circuit City. I can get lost in here. It's like my whole life was about serving him. You missed a spot. Oops. I began to worry about him all day. Yeah, man, I know you're at work and everything, but uh, some guy from Collections, he keep calling here. I tell him only speak pesos, though. No Camprendo Repo, senor? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Gracias. And all night. Yes, I like to order the Turbo Floss 9000 Rapid Gum Care System. And uh, by any chance, do y'all have any of those uh, bedazzlers? 
Yeah, that was bomb, let me tell you. I had to do something. I had to put him in his place. Lord, man, where you been? I called you like about 50 times. Who's this guy? This better be the guy that's supposed to be putting in my jacuzzi. This is Jim. He's a financial counselor. It wasn't pretty. But Jim helped me get Benjamin under control. Get in the savings chair. Man, get in the no chair. Be firm. Get in the savings chair. Do you know who I think I am? Hit him with the budget. Man, that ain't doing nothing. Oh, hey, man. Okay, this chair right here. I'm getting in there, man. I'm getting in there. All you have to do is stop, man. You have to say that, man. It really works. Okay. Now, things are different around here. Hey, stop doing bills, man. What are you doing? Come on, man. Oh, oh, my head. Whoa, it's me. It's feeling kind of faint. I need a cash advance, man. Come on. Benjamin is working for me. Now remember, no TV until you earn some interest. I even have him working for the church. Is my 10% up yet? Not yet! <laughs> well, we are, we're going to talk about money because money talks about us. And what your money would say might be different than what the person sitting next to you would say. We're going to talk about money because Jesus talks about money. Because in the scriptures, Jesus talks about money in the New Testament more than he talks about heaven and hell combined. And as I've been looking at it and studying it this week, I've noticed what he said about money, but I also noticed when he said it and who he said it to, which is interesting. And I'll tell you why. You know, around Crossroads, we often talk about one of our values is that everyone should feel welcome when they walk through our doors. One of our key values, that everyone's welcome here. Nobody's perfect, and we hope that you feel like that. And so what that means is many, many people are here investigating faith, and you're not sure yet what you believe. And so and if you do not have the who is Jesus question answered yet, to talk about what he says about money uh, might be, you know, random, seem random or unhelpful or even offensive in some way. So, so a lot of the time, we will uh, shade towards uh, the topics that have to do with figuring out who Jesus is in your life before we talk about behavior. Even last week, remember I said that identity always precedes behavior. So we tend to focus on our identity as people that God has created and loved and wants to be a part of our lives. But last week, as I was looking at, at this scripture, something was really interesting in Luke chapter 12. That's where we're going to study today. In Luke 12, it begins with this verse. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. This is verse 1. Meanwhile, a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. That, now, I think that's critical and interesting for this reason. Jesus was talking to his followers, but there was a crowd of many thousands of people. Some of them would have believed in him. Some of them didn't believe in him. And so Jesus talked about money, in this case, in a way that his disciples were to learn, but that he was expecting that a lot of other people would overhear. As a matter of fact, in, in verse 41, if you kept going down in, in Luke chapter 12, Peter is confused of who Jesus is actually talking to. And he says, Jesus, are you telling us the story for us or for everyone? And I think the answer Jesus would have given would be yes. Yeah. I am telling this to you. You need to learn this. If you're a follower of Christ, what we're going to talk about this morning, you need to learn. But many of you here might not have decided what you believe about Jesus yet. And you need to hear it as well, according to the Bible. And so I, I think that's interesting. We're going to talk about money because your money talks about you, because Jesus talks about money. And because when Jesus talks about money, he talks about it to his followers so that other people can overhear what he said so as we launch into this series here's what i want to tell you whether 
you believe in Jesus, whether you don't believe in Jesus, or whether you're not sure whether you believe in Jesus, and I think that probably covers the whole gamut, regardless of which one of those categories you would place yourself in, do not construe anything that I'm going to say or anything that's going to be said in the next several weeks as us asking you for money, as Jesus asking for your money. As you're going to see in a minute, Jesus does ask for something, but it's not your money. And so we are not, we've already asked you for your money. We already, the baskets went by and, and that kind of thing, and we do that every week. Yeah, but this is not so that you'll give more money. This is so that you and I might be able to be wise and listen because money talks. And what it says reveals some things better than almost any other avenue in our lives. So um, we're going to launch into this series on money talks, and we're going to talk about um, how our money reveals things about us. Okay, so uh, with that said, uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 12. That's where we're going to be reading this morning. An encounter that Jesus has with someone and in a story that he tells as a response to this encounter. Luke chapter 12. I'm going to be reading verses 13 to 21. Listen. Someone in the crowd said to him, that would be Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard. Against all kinds of greed, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And then I'll store my grain and my goods. And then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. This is God's Word. And this is an amazing encounter. I think it highlights for us uh, three moments here it, it it reveals three different things it's it's a request that leads to a warning and it's it's a story that leads to name calling <laughs> and then it's a summary that leads to a response so uh, a, a request leads to a warning let's do that first then a story that ends up with name calling and then there's a summary that leads to a response Let's look at those together. First of all, it's a request. The, the gentleman, it says, from the crowd, so not one of the followers of Jesus, comes to him and makes a request. And the request is this. Tell my brother to give me some of the money, some of the family's inheritance. And that's not so strange because sometimes rabbis in the first century were put in positions of civil authority and people would come and, and he, they would hear cases there's no evidence that jesus ever did that so that's probably not the reason that the guy came to him it's probably more in line with because jesus talked about money and possession so much and if you were around him for any length of time you knew that he had opinions about this and so i think that the the fellow from the crowd heard jesus talking and came up and said he's probably got something to say about this and so I'm going to ask him to tell my brother to give me some of the money. Now, Jesus answers, why are you asking me this? Who made me the judge? Who made me the arbiter? The word's actually a divider between you. Now, that is strange. And it might not have seemed strange to you. But the, the guy from the crowd comes to Jesus, asks him to divide the money, make his brother give him some money. And Jesus responds by saying, that's not my role. I'm not judge or divider. What makes that so odd is because Jesus declares himself both at different points in the scripture. As a matter of fact, in this 
chapter, if you keep reading on down to verse 51, Jesus says, I came to be a divider. When just previously he says to the guy, I'm not a divider. I'm not a judge. Other places Jesus says, I am the one who judges. And so what does he mean when he says, I'm not here to be judge or divider of you? Well, we get a clue by the warning that comes out next. He says, watch out. Be on your guard. Now, if you hadn't read the the passage already, what would you imagine was going to come out of Jesus' mouth next? If he says, watch out. Be on your guard against, you know what I would think? The devil. The, um, The devil or evil. Watch out. Be on your guard against him, and you should. But that's not what he says. Watch out. Be on your guard against, you know, I don't know what else you would think. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I don't know what I would, but, but what he actually says is this. Listen. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Now, that seems odd. Greed is, if you look it up, the extreme desire for more than one's share. The extreme desire for more. Jesus says, watch out for that. Be careful. Be on your guard against all kinds of wanting more. And then he says this line. Life because life does not consist in the abundance of its of possessions. And I, I know that you think it does. Jesus says to this guy. I know that why you're asking me for this is because you think that this is what will make your life better. I know that's what you think. Just a little more. Thank goodness none of us can relate to this guy. Of course we can. I can. I think most of the people buying lottery tickets can. Most of us would sign up for just a little more and yet jesus says watch out for that be on your guard against all kinds of wanting more as a matter of fact every time anyone goes to jesus and asks for just a little more a little better it boils down to this same warning it points to the same issue this man wanted jesus to make his brother share his money with him why It's very obvious because he thought if I had a little more, that would make my life better. If I had a little more money, I'd be happier. And I think that we often look at Jesus this way, that that we our requests to Jesus are if you could just give me that if she would just if he would just propose, if my boss would just. Jesus, can you make the stock market? Can you make me win the lotto? Can you? If I could just have a little more, then I think it would be much better. How does Jesus answer? He says, that's not my role. I didn't come, even though in other places I am called a divider and I am called a judge. He says, this way, I'm not here for that. I didn't come to make your life a little better. I came to be your life. I I came to replace those things at the center of your life. It's as though Jesus is saying, as long as you think that a little more inheritance is what you need, you're going to be frustrated with me. So then he says, let me tell you a story. Because you're going to end up being frustrated with who I am. And maybe you are today. Maybe you continually ask Jesus and he's not coming through for you in the way that you want him to. And so maybe you're frustrated with him. And then Jesus says, let me tell you a story. So number one is there's a request that leads to a challenge. Number two is there is a story that leads to name calling. Let's look at the story together. The story is of this one character who is relatively well off. It, It says that he was a rich man. And it's interesting to me to point out that Jesus notes that it was the ground of the rich man that produced the crop. Isn't that interesting? It it reminds me, Jesus saying, 
Like, just, uh, you know, simmer down there, buddy. All that you have was given to you by my father. So don't go taking, cru- just settle down. It reminds me of that you maybe have heard this uh, interaction that uh, supposedly it would have happened between an atheist and, and God, which I'm not sure how that happens because the atheist believes there is no God. But maybe the atheist says it doesn't matter that you exist, God, because the atheist was a scientist. You heard this? And he said, I can do everything that you did. We can do organ transplants. We even have figured out how to create DNA. So you create a person, and I can create a person. And so God says, all right, let me see you. And so the guy says, okay, I can create somebody with nothing but dirt. And God says, well, get your own dirt. Right? The, Jesus is saying, look, dude, just settle down. All that you have is in one way or another a function of what I've given you. And this guy has done very well. He, he has a lot. And, and so what's his dilemma? His dilemma is he has too much. Huh. His dilemma is that he has too much. Now, some of you are saying at this point, I can't relate to this guy. I, don't, I can't think of anywhere in my life that I have too much. That's not my issue. And maybe that's true, but I think you can relate to this guy. First, if you live in our country, especially in our neck of the woods, you're probably in the highest 2% of, um, in terms of wealth in the world. Uh, if you own a car and or a house, you're probably in the top 1% uh, of wealth in, in the world. But secondly, I think you can identify with this guy because he assumes that God's blessings that he has received are for him. And I think that's an assumption that most of us make. Uh, that's an assumption that I make most of the time. That the good things that I receive in my life are mostly for me. And that's exactly what this guy thinks. In other words, think about this for a second. Maybe his barns were exactly the right size. Maybe the barns that he had initially were perfectly suited to meet all of his needs. And all of the extra that he got was just that. It was extra. It it was for him to distribute uh, to people who were in need. It was something for him to to distribute for those who had less than him. All sorts of different options of what you could do besides tear down your barns and build bigger ones, assuming that it was all for you. But I think most of us do exactly what he did. Whatever we get, we assume is for us and we need it. And in that way, we are an awful lot like this guy in the story that Jesus is telling. The key piece of information is that he was not satisfied with what his barns currently held. He wanted a little more. He wanted to keep a little more. And God says in the story, Jesus says, that makes him a fool. It's a story that leads to name calling. Now, uh, God doesn't go around just calling people fools um, all throughout the Bible. I, I can only find one other place, in fact, that, that God labels someone, this person is a fool. And that's in the Old Testament. Where you see, it says a fool is the one who says in his heart there is no God. Now, that's interesting that the same word, fool, is used by Jesus in this story for someone who just wants a little more. Wow, those two people are called the same thing. And fool in the Bible is not someone who lacks intellectual capability. It's not. It's not someone who's dumb, who, whose IQ is low. It's someone who refuses to see reality as God reveals it. And so you can see this rich, uh, successful person fails to see that there's anything beyond this life. Now, If this life is all there is, this guy's a genius. Would you agree? Think about it. If now is all there is, this guy's a genius. He's done well. He has saved it all. He he has mitigated any risk as long as he lives. 
This guy's a genius. However, if now is not all there is, then he's a fool. And that's what Jesus calls him. He says, you have failed to see spiritual reality. Money can blind you to the fact that there's anything more than now. It can blind you to the fact of spiritual reality. It can make you a fool. Now, how does it feel to be called a fool? Has anybody ever called you that? Imagine if you walked in this morning and you were greeted by our, our greeters there at the door. You made your way over uh, to get some uh, coffee and some donuts. And someone came up to you and, and said, hey, I've been meaning to tell you something. I think you are the biggest fool in the whole place. How would you respond? Would you be defensive? Would, would, would you want to avoid that person <laughs> for the rest of the morning? Would you be angry? Would you take a swing at him? Yeah, some of you ladies would take a swing. No, I'm just teasing. What, how would you respond? If somebody really did just come up and say, you are a big fool. In effect, that's what God's doing here. He's saying, what else would you call someone who is blinded to the fact that now is not all there is and acts like this? And so I would say, you know, when if I came to you after this message and said, hey, I'd like to uh, see all of your financial records over the past five years. Why don't you just share them with everybody? I'd love to know how much you made, how much you spent, what you spent it on, how much you gave. How much I'd love to still love to know that. Can you just show us all that? How would you feel? You know, uh, I'll, most of us, I think, would feel a little defensive. Well, why do you need to see that? It's personal. We, we might avoid any other interaction. We, we, we might be angry. We might feel uncomfortable. Here's the point. If that's your response when we start talking about money and revealing what your money says about you, then you know what your money is saying? Your money is saying, you're a fool. You've been very foolish. Now, I don't like to hear that. <laughs> That's the last, uh, one of the last things that I want to hear. But if I'm honest, sometimes that's what my money is saying about me. Okay, we've got to wrap this up. Number one, there's a request that leads to a challenge. Number two, there is a story that leads to name calling. But finally, there's this summary that leads to a response. Where Jesus says in verse 21, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up for themselves but is not rich towards God. Now, I love that he says, this is how it will be. And we don't know how it ends. We don't know if the two brothers went away and worked things out because of Jesus' refusal to get involved. I can almost imagine one of them, you know, going away and saying, see, Jesus says, mind your own business. <laughs> and he's going to keep all his money. Or, or the other one said, no, he wants us to build bigger barns. That, I think, was the point of the story. I, we don't know what happens with them. Anyone who stores up things for themselves and is not rich towards God could be a picture of you. Could be a picture of me. Whether you have a lot of money or not very much money, it doesn't matter. Either way, this could be a picture of you. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about some specifics in terms of your money. And it's, it is in an attempt to draw attention to something that may be affecting your life more than anything else we could talk about over the next several weeks. Um, and, and it will make people uncomfortable. It will make uh, you defensive on some level. But it has to do with more than just your money. It has to do with your heart, with your life. 
See, Jesus says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What, what Jesus wants is to be your life, not to give you money to make your life work better. And so, if, if money is the one piece that has a grip on our lives that prevents us from seeing Jesus in the way that he wants to be seen, of allowing him to work in the way that he wants to be worked, why in the world wouldn't we talk about it? Just because it makes us uncomfortable? I am saying that if we could be free of the bondage that we feel to money, it might be the biggest spiritual breakthrough that we've ever had in our lives. So why would we avoid that topic? We want to produce freedom from the bondage. It's, it's as if we have an addiction all of us. And it's addiction to money and to more. If you raised your hand at the beginning, yeah, I'd like a little bit more. We all have this addiction. And if we could create freedom from that addiction, God could really do something with us. So I, I hope you'll come back <laughs> with that introduction. Because there's freedom and there's hope. And there's life. Money does talk. What is yours saying? How can we listen and then act wisely and create life and freedom where right now there is bondage and decay? Well, let's close there for this week and invite the worship teams to come back up. As they do, let's pray together. Father, thank you for caring about our whole lives, not just part or um, separate sections of our lives. Thank you for caring about everything and, and teaching us about something so important as our money and our stuff. I pray that you'd make us courageous, courageous enough to listen and to be honest with ourselves. God, help us um, to be bold. And to trust that you do actually not want or need our money, but you want us. And so I pray that we'd hear those words loud and clear this morning. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.